So today we're going to be covering some information regarding the Stitzer Burnett antitrust lawsuit that's been going around and its potential impacts on the California real estate industry and the real estate industry in general. So um, I haven't really had time to talk about this case a whole lot. I've been busy with other things, um, mainly selling homes. <laughs> so um, and bottom line is, if you want to cut to the quick of it all, nothing's really changing at this point. Um, California is, these are just my comments on it. California is a very litigious state and a lot of the consumer pro consumer type of laws have been written for California long ago. This lawsuit was filed in another state, uh, with different laws. So I think it was Missouri. So that gives you an idea of really to, you know, a little bit of apples and oranges, but it does impact some of the principles involved in the way we talk to our clients, to you about commissions and uh, the way we work for you. So I thought I would go ahead and I, I was really interested to see the legal uh, aspect from the California Association of Realtors. So I thought I would just go ahead and share this with you. This is from our website and it's from our legal department. And so what it does talk about is, uh, and I'm just going to go through, there's about 13 or 15 frequently asked questions here. And, you know, what is the Stitzer Burnett versus the National, the NAR or National Association of Realtors jury verdict? And what was it all about? So let's go ahead and go through this. So this was a class action lawsuit filed. Again, this was in federal court in the state of Missouri. So the plaintiff included home sellers in Missouri who sold their properties between April, 2015 and June, 2022. So they used various MLS companies and the commissions were commissions paid to a listing agent. So a listing agent uh, is hired much like a contractor is hired to build a house. Um, a listing agent is hired to sell a house. So they will have sometimes what's called a subcontractor or a sub agent uh, who just like a house has plumbing contractors, electrical contractors. Well, agents have sub agents or buyer's agents who will bring a buyer and you split the commissions. So that's essentially the best illustration I have that I've heard uh, to use here to explain that. So, um, so what happened is the, uh, the, the listing agents offered a commission to the buyer's agent, but in 2019, the plaintiff sued NAR and four large brokerages. So these all included Anywhere Real Estate, which used to be Rheology, uh, Remax, Keller Williams, and Home Services of America. The plaintiffs claim that the defendants conspired to keep real estate commission rates high in violation of antitrust law. Now, I've been in the business for about 20 years and I was taught to never talk about fixed rates. Like that's antitrust law. That goes against the Sherman Williamson Act of antitrust from back almost a hundred years ago. So commissions are always negotiable. Um, they're not set in stone by anybody, nor does anybody force you to set those commissions in stone. So even I have a tiered commission rate that we use with clients. So uh, depending on how it's how sort of services you like, so you kind of like a buffet, you can kind of pick and choose what you need uh, to accomplish your task of selling your home. Uh, so uh, anyway, they're claiming that these defendants, if these companies conspired with NAR to keep or inflate commission rates, uh, the compensation rule that they're talking about is for MLSs share that 50-50 split. In other words, if a, a seller pays me 6% for a listing, I split it. 3% to our office and 3% to the buyer's office. So that's typically what we're talking about here. Um, so what the claim is, is that the MLS rules that tell us to pay a buyer's commission um, cause the sellers to pay too much in real estate commissions. Now, this is interesting because the sellers got what they asked for in terms of selling their homes. They made their profits, their gains, and sold their homes and moved on. Now they're coming back and saying that, though, oh, wait, wait a minute, I really didn't want to pay a buyer's commission. Now, if anybody knows or has sold real estate in California, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but in California, when you pay a commission uh, it's or you hire a realtor, it's on the first page of the listing agreement of you know the 6% to the main office or 5%, whatever you negotiate. And then the split goes below of what you're going to pay a sub agent or a buyer's agent. So it's very clear in our contracts. Um, I'm not familiar with or claiming to be knowledgeable at all about what was going on in the Missouri contract, but obviously they're they're claiming that they didn't know that there was a split and that they had to pay an extra amount. So um, the jury found that uh, they were guilty or they awarded them 
It decided against the defendants and issued a verdict of $1.8 billion. Um, of course, the attorneys are going to get 33%, uh, which, by the way, is also fixed, I found out. like All the attorneys charge 33% for these types of lawsuits. So, um, you know, maybe some attorney is going to challenge that. I doubt it. But nonetheless, I thought that was an interesting point. But uh, nonetheless, the, 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 there was a the jury awarded $1.8 billion, could be tripled up to $5 billion is what they're looks like they're asking for. Uh, but of course, as with any case like this, and you're talking big numbers like this, it's not over yet because all, all the defendants have filed appeals. Uh, the two other defendants, Anywhere Real Estate and Remax, uh, settled before the trial. So they've already paid out, I think, $50 million or $100 million uh, prior to the trial going going through. So that kind of gives you a quick synopsis or summary of what's going on with the uh, Sitzer-Burnett trial um, and kind of what happened there. Uh, so question number two here, is there a lawsuit against California Association of Realtors? No, the California Association of Realtors is not a defendant in the Stitzer-Burnett lawsuit. Um, nor any other lawsuits filed against NAR and the real estate brokerages. So it's this is, again, a Missouri case, and there's nothing currently filed against CAR or the California Association of Realtors. The third question here is, do individual CAR members have liability because they're members of the association and NAR or because they're affiliated with any other franchise of the defendants? The answer is no. The uh, defendants of the franchise and NAR entity are entities. So the plaintiffs did not sue, nor are they seeking damages from the individual realtors. Um, they, does this mean they might open the door for lawsuits against boutique realtors or, or brokerages that um, are not part of the big groups? Probably. Um, attorneys will go um, claim that they need to protect the buyer's interest in all these other cases that um, need to be opened now against other real estate brokerages, perhaps. That's that remains to be seen. We're not sure if that's going to happen, but uh, anyway, these are these are corporate legal entities, so they would have to uh, the, the the members of those entities would not be liable at, at this point. So um, we pay, uh, I believe, as realtors, we pay one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars a year uh, to be members of the National Association of Realtors. Uh, we pay to be members of California Association of Realtors. And then we all pay for our local associations in Monterey County. It's the Monterey County Association of Realtors. In San Luis Obispo County, there's various real uh, associations. They're a little more broken up in San Luis Obispo County than I've seen in other counties. Same with Santa Barbara County. Um, each city almost has its own association. So it's a little more disjointed as you get further south on the central coast. So, But realtors pay for these associations to be members of them and to share the MLS information. So this is the data of the listings, much like the public sees on Zillow. Well, the agents share that with, the, with themselves um, also on their own network that's private for real estate agents. So that's the way people have uh, received their listings for since about the 90s when MLSs began to rise. So... What are the next steps for the Stitzer Burnett lawsuit? Well, NARA will post the necessary bond to appeal the verdict, and they're confident that they'll ultimately prevail in the case. So they're already preparing an appeal, of course, um, and they will ask the courts the courts to reduce the damages. So how? next question, how long will the appeal process take and what's the likely outcome? Well, the appeals process is very lengthy, and the lawsuit will probably really not reach a final decision for several years. A trial judge hasn't issued the final order on the jury's October 31st verdict. And we don't know whether this will eventually be an injunctive orders that might require the defendants to alter their business practices or policies. So it will take months before the defendants first appellate briefs are filed in the appellate court. And after those briefs are filed with the court appeal, Carl will have better information about the specific legal arguments and grounds supporting the defendant's appeal. So Sounds like this is going to be wrangled up in the courts for some time. And this, I thought this was interesting. Who will receive the damages payouts? Well, as noted above, it will likely take several years before a final decision is made in the case. If the jury's verdict is ultimately affirmed, well, the defendants need to pay the damages. Then each of the members of the plaintiff's cases, home sellers in Missouri during the relevant time period, and their attorneys would receive payment. So of the $1.5 billion, those attorneys are going to get 33% of that. So, you know, figure what that is, right? So that's 
um, probably about 400. That's a good chunk. That's going to be about $400 million of that settlement amount, maybe even more. So what are the Sitzer Burnett settlements for Anywhere Real Estate and Remax? So this is these are the ones that settled before the, uh, the trial began. So without admitting liability, Anywhere Real Estate agreed to settle claims against it, against it in this the Sitzer Burnett case with an antitrust case, the more antitrust buyers class action lawsuit, all for $83.5 million. So they just paid it out. They said, we're done. We're not participating in this. Um, we're not admitting guilt, but we just want to settle with you so we don't have to go through all this. So the proposed settlement includes uh, required practice changes, including prohibiting company-owned brokerages and their affiliated agents from claiming buyer agent services are free, uh, requiring the inclusion of the listing broker's offer of compensation as soon as possible in active listings, consistent with MLS rules, and capabilities of third-party website operators prohibiting the use of technology and manual sorting listings by offers of compensation unless requested by the client. So, and reminding franchisees that the company has no rule requiring offers of compensation to buyer's agents. So essentially meaning a little more disclosure here. So disclosing uh, what buyer's commissions are and buyer's agents commissions are, which uh, we've seen for some time now. So a lot of people were already making these changes in the MLSs. And again, it's all good. It's all just more transparency. These are numbers you used to see at the closing table. Um, when you did close, you would see how much the realtors were making, how much the lenders are making, and uh, how much the title companies are charging as well. So everybody's fees are included in there in the transactions. So it's always very clear there. Um, anywhere real estate agreed to deposit $10 million into a settlement fund after preliminary court approval was granted $20 million after court approval of fees and costs typically landed, granted with the court's final approval and the remaining balance after final court approval and all appellate rights are exhausted. The final court approval of this settlement is expected by mid-2024. So that's for the settlements. So they settled out, out of court. So a few weeks after the above settlement, Remax agreed to a similar settlement for $55 million and agreed to make similar changes in its business practices. The Remax settlement also still requires court approval. So all of these, uh, I like how it said that they include required practice changes. So all of these changes are ones that were pretty in California, I felt were pretty much in place, at least the ones I'm seeing that everybody is in a big uproar about. We already have these disclosures in California. We're very clear on what we're charging a lender, or I'm, I'm sorry, a seller, and how we're splitting that with the other agent, like I mentioned at the beginning. So, so why didn't NAR settle? Well, due to their extremely sensitive nature, settlement negotiations are conducted with the strictest confidentiality, confidentiality by the parties and their attorneys. So CAR doesn't have information about the settlement discussions or offers that might have been made to NAR, and CAR doesn't know whether the plaintiff offered any settlement deals that were, un, that were reasonable. But it is possible there will be future settlement discussions between the parties. But, so, but what this means is that the current time NAR is pursuing an appeal and they're confident they're going to win the case. So that's that's on the appeal level. So can a real estate brokerage that settled in the Sitzer Burnett case be sued again in a different lawsuit? Well, that depends according to the attorneys here. Depends on the specific facts and circumstances. It is possible for a brokerage that was sued in the case to be sued in another. Different lawsuits by different plaintiffs who might allege new or different types of claims. So depending on the conditions outlined in a final court approval agreement, real estate brokerage, there may be protections that limit or prevent future claims against the brokers that have settled. So for example, if anywhere real estate and REMAX propose settlements, if they're approved, the released franchises and their franchisees and agents should be protected from many similar types of antitrust claims. So in other words, they're making the changes, they're settled, it's going to protect them from any future uh, frivolous type of claims or other lawsuits. So in a sense, they're done. They've already uh, had their day in court. Uh, do we think NAR will file for bankruptcy? Well, it's a good question, but it is too early to speculate about the possibility of bankruptcy because the case has not reached the final resolution. So again, all this hoopla, all the media coverage you're seeing, it's also, I think that's why I haven't paid attention to it much. It's also premature because I know these are court cases and they will take a while to settle, but it's being settled 
also on this, just like many things are, changes and settlements are happening because of social media, because of the news and causing some changes already in some MLSs. So, so far our MLSs on the central coast have been pretty much business as usual. Again, because disclosures have always been there and we've always given this information. There's never been really any hidden secrets about how we charge commissions in California or um, keeping uh, commissions uh, inflated because of a, this is how we do it here. Um, it's never that way. It is always negotiable. Um, so it's uncertain whether NAR and the co-defendants will ultimately need to pay any damages or if they do need to pay, how much would need to be paid. So, so we don't know that if that will lead to a bankruptcy for the National Association of Realtors because we just don't have the final numbers yet. So can NAR pay for the necessary bond to proceed with an appeal? And the answer is yes. NAR stated it has sufficient funds to pay the bond and it will pursue an appeal. I think they've already done that by now. And then the last question here is, will NAR increase its dues to pay for this and other lawsuits? NAR has stated that it does not plan to raise membership dues. But you know, when you've got that many realtors, um, it's probably not going to be that much of an increase if they did uh, run into a tight spot where they needed to. And that's in just my opinion. Uh, so 13, do smaller independent brokerages have the same risk of being sued in similar antitrust lawsuits? That's what I was mentioning before. Uh, the answer is the quick answer is no. There's a much lower risk because class action plaintiff suits target usually the big corporate ones. Why? Because there's a lot of money there and um, a little more compensation for them. So uh, to proceed with a class action, plaintiff's law firms need to certify the class by demonstrating the plaintiffs are similarly situated with the high burden by itself and much more different to achieve if defendant brokerages are independent and have different company policies and practices, right? So that means is um, each brokerage is gonna have its own rules and it's really hard for um, lawyers to go in and attack those rules when it's just, hey, this is what we do at our brokerage. So it'll be disjointed in that sense. Whereas with these cases, these were large companies that had national rules, let's say, or national arrangements. Um, so very easy targets, right? So it's kind of like the big whales, if you will. So a little easier to target there for lawsuits. And then also plaintiff's law firms usually target larger companies because it's more likely those companies will have a lot of money to pay damages. So it boils down to the money and uh, who's going to pay me if I'm the attorney, right? And then um, our next question, another good question, what is the new Gibson class action lawsuit filed against NAR, Compass, EXP, Redfin, and other brokerages about? So this is a little close to home because we're I'm part of EXP. Um, but after the jury's verdict in Sitzer Burnett, the same attorney, same attorney said, okay, let's, uh, this was easy. Let's go ahead and do the other big brokerages uh, that are national. Uh, so they went ahead and filed another one. They had it ready to go the same day. Again, it's in the same state. So again, of course, it's making national headlines because these are big companies, but it's again, it's in Missouri's federal court and it's all the same thing, same claims, same lawsuits, uh, including home sellers who listed a property for sale, the MLS. Uh, with one of the same the name brokerages, anybody who paid a buyer's commission in Missouri from October 31st to the present. So uh, the new lawsuit was just filed recently. So there's very little information about the time, about the defendant's responses and um, what's going to happen in that case. So it's just, a, we're just going to have like that wait and see attitude on this one as well. So is there a possibility for a class action lawsuit in California so here's the big question is, uh, you've heard on the news that this was filed in Missouri. What's going to be the impact to us in California? Here it is. It says, although it's possible, there are factors that would probably make it more challenging to file a similar California action, including California laws. And here's the kicker, California laws that confirm the pro-consumer and competitive benefits of MLSs. So pro-consumer and competitive benefits. California has more attorneys than probably any other state in the United States. So if there was lawsuits to be filed or claims to be made against these contracts that we have, or these arrangements with MLSs, any antitrust situations, those would have been fought long ago. Is is And again, that's my opinion. This is just my opinion also. But it looks like the legal team here from the California Association of Realtors is kind of taking that same stance that uh, 
you know, many of our contracts are pro-consumer. They're protecting the consumers already by forcing realtors, forcing brokerages to disclose exactly what the commissions are and how they're being split. So you can make special arrangements. There are nothing set. Even when you fill out the forms, everything's blank. There's no preset commissions, uh, meaning everything's negotiable. You can pay fat, flat fees. You can play, pay commissions. Uh, you can sell your house on your own and you can pay companies to put the home on the MLS if you don't want to pay a realtor. I mean, there's all kinds of, again, it's like a buffet, a pick and choose type of service of what you want to get done to sell your home or how you want to accomplish that. So it's much like um, building that house, right? So you're going to, you can, you can hire um, contractors that have experience. You can hire new contractors. It's much the same. So very similar process that's happening in, in the real estate business. So, so again, the California laws are already in place or California contracts really affirm a lot of this. Um, the competitive benefits of MLSs are very true because before, um, I just want to stop on this for a minute because before buyers didn't have representation. There were no buyer's agents. If you were a buyer, you would be driving around neighborhoods or uh, looking for open houses in the paper on the weekend um, and then going and seeing those and uh, seeing if you like that house and you'd go to the next one and if you liked the house, you dealt with that agent. So there was no representation for a buyer. You didn't have a buyer's agent helping you shop for homes and, and help you make decisions and to fight on your side or be on your side to make sure your, your interests were protected in, in the transaction. So um, that happened more in the 90s. Uh, why? Because we had so many lawsuits of buyers who were really being taken advantage of by sellers. So these cases all went to court and what evolved from that was a buyer's agent. And as MLSs became more powerful and the internet evolved, again, it's all a, a, a changing process. The internet came along and it was very easy for associations to be formed and MLSs to be formed where data could be shared of all the listings in an area. Right now you can see anything you want, anywhere you want. And you can see how much the commissions are to the buyer's agent or what's being offered. Um, and that's anywhere now across the United States. So again, uh, as far as the contracts go, it would be very hard for a class action lawsuit uh, to occur in California. So uh, having said that, CAR continues to remind members that they should have open and transparent discussions with their clients about their compensation including the negotiability of real estate commissions and other types of broker compensation. So do agents make money just off commissions? No, they have other charges too. They can charge, um, you know, I, I don't, I just charge a straight commission. Most agents do, uh, but there are some agents that have um, other fees above and beyond the sales commission because maybe they're doing staging for you or other things uh, that are above and beyond that uh, they would want to be compensated for. Some even charge for advertising. You have an advertising fee if you cancel the listing within a certain amount of time. Things of that nature. So all negotiable, all deciding on you know what type of brokerage you want helping you or representing you in your transaction. Okay. So question number sixteen here: Does a Sitzer Burnett verdict affect the Department of Justice settlement with NAR? So the reason this question is here is because, uh, well, the quick answer is not directly. So the Department of Justice had filed against NAR at one point or had been uh, reached a settlement with them back in 2020, about three years ago. And uh, so they've been watching this. They call it um, monitoring developments, as they say, uh, as, and they've filed some statements of interest in uh, many of the MLS related lawsuits. So it's not clear yet whether the Department of Justice is going to take action related to commissions and, and brokerage practices at this point. Um, probably because it, I don't believe there really isn't any collusion, you know, regarding commissions. So uh, at least in California, there's not, because uh, again, I can't comment on any of the other states. I'm not licensed in those states. I'm licensed in California. And um, so I don't see where uh, in California we would have that issue. So what impact will the antitrust case have on the relationship between 
the National Association of Realtors and the California Association of Realtors, um, or between them and the local Association of Realtors, all those that we mentioned, right? So Monterey County, Santa Clara County has their own, uh, and, and many of the other, um, you know, even some municipalities have their own associations as well. So, uh, so currently there's no direct impact on those relationships. Um, and the case is not over though. Uh, the California Association of Realtors is monitoring things closely, uh, really to provide our members with the resources we need to again, provide services to our clients, to our, to you, the consumers. Um, and there is a, uh, you know, a big lobby. They have a big lobby, of course, in, in, on the national and state levels uh, between these associations, which is what they're formed for, uh, just like any other industry would have a lobby. All right. So, uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. The rest of these I'm going to cover in another video. Um, I'm going to break these up. So the others are, uh, so stay tuned. We'll have members questions about California real estate transactions and broker practices. We'll cover that in another video. But again, these things are evolving. And the bottom line is it's all about disclosure. If you have questions about commissions, if in doubt, check it out, ask your realtor. Um, you should be able to get very clearly, especially if your realtor is also a lender. That's a whole nother topic. Um, but if your realtor is also a lender, then you should know exactly how much they're making on the lending side, as well as on the commission side to sell you the home. So, um, you know, some people feel it's a conflict of interest to be the lender and the realtor in the transaction, but you know, that's for the consumer to decide. Again, it's all disclosure. Do you know upfront, upfront, are you being told what's going on with the transaction? So that's really the key in a lot of this is disclosure and making sure everyone's got eyes wide open on what's going on with the transaction. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And really sum this up. So bottom line is we know we've had a lot of news media coverage on what's going on with these cases. And you know, you hear all these things like, oh no, buyer's agents are are gonna be out. No more buyer's agents. What would happen if we had no more buyer's agents? Just think about that scenario. We would go back 20, 30, 40 years to when there were no buyer's agents um, and a consumer was on their own. So I kind of touched on that earlier, right? So a buyer would uh, be completely out. So we we do have some people on our team that are from Australia, that are um, from South Africa. And in those countries, um, I've even had clients from Australia who've told me how a seller essentially uh, puts their house on the market and then puts it out publicly. And then agents just bring the buyers to them. And then whoever... Uh, has the winning offer or the winning buyer is the one that uh, writes up the contract for both of them. So in those cases, who's being represented and how? So uh, the, each of those, uh, the agents in those areas have said, you don't really want what we have here. Like that, if that's where you're headed, you don't want this. Like uh, the United States system is very efficient and uh, very uh, uh open-ended, if you will, in terms of allowing a seller to put a house out for market and then have buyer's agents out competing and searching for their clients. And buyer's agents do work hard. Um, I do both listings and buyer representation. So I know that uh, there each has its own specificity and its own uh, realm of work that's involved and uh, transactions. And yes, you do represent a buyer uh, to protect their interest a certain way. And then a seller uh, has their own interest that you're protecting as well. So in other words, you have a fiduciary responsibility to each of your clients. So whether you're, the rep you're representing them as a seller, as a listing agent, or you're representing them, them as a buyer, be guiding them through the process of buying that home or that investment property. So with all that being said, we it seems like if these cases are claiming and what you're hearing is claiming that all buyer's agents are going to go away, I think that's that's a little bit of clickbait information and they're trying to get you to click on the ads so that you can uh, just get them some ad revenue. But I, I don't see any major changes at this point. It's business as usual. It's why it's taken me a couple of weeks to even get to this because 
um, there probably won't be any changes other than what you've seen so far. If you go on any of the public websites, including our own, my, my GomezHomes.com, the uh, EXP website, the uh, Realtor.com, Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, all those websites, everybody's been disclosing what the buyer's agent's commissions are. So there's no surprise to anybody about what the cost is, that is being paid out to a buyer's agent. And really, they do earn their commission. They're out providing a service. They're informing you of you know all the different points that are part of a transaction. And they really are looking out for your interest to make sure paperwork's in order, inspections are done, reviewing the inspections with you, um, how to maneuver those things, how to negotiate those things. All of those are part of what a buyer's agent does. Um, do agents always split that commission 50-50? No. Some listing agents keep more of the commission than what they give to the buyer's agent. Um, uh, I think I've, I've had that happen a couple of times in some transactions because the seller's wanted to do that. And it's, it's not a very comfortable spot to be in. Uh, I've been on the other side where I've received less commission than the listing agent. And I feel it's it's not a fair thing. And so in each of those, so I always split 50-50. Uh, but that's just me. Everybody else might do something different. But um, a buyer's agent works just as hard as a listing agent, just a different way. So um, just a different process. But everybody's a professional and everybody's accomplishing the same goal of matching that buyer to that seller and helping a really smooth transaction happen so that uh, you know a seller can sell their home and a buyer can move into their new home mm -hmm. as well. So hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, I know that was a very lengthy description or discussion about the process, but I, I thought it was long overdue. I thought I'd prepare this video for this week's newsletter. In addition to all the marketing, um, regular market updates, I should say, that you're going to see below. Uh, for each of the counties and areas that, that we're showing uh, with the current market trends that we're seeing. So interest rates dropped a little bit. Yay. Um, this is being done just before Thanksgiving 2023. So I will be working all weekend. So feel free to call me. Um, I'm never too busy for your referrals. You probably see that all the time in my emails and tags. Um, and I really do mean it. And, uh, you know, I, I am a very hardworking realtor. And uh, who you work with does matter. So be sure to uh, keep me in mind if you're thinking of buying or selling or if there's anything else in the world I can do for you, just let me know. Thanks again for joining. Take care.